Good morning, everyone. So today our first speaker is Marcel Lewinstein, and there is also an announcement. There is there will be a change in the program. Uh, Susanna Welga had a small accident, so she will not uh, be able to come. So welcome, Marcel, please. Thank you very much. So before I come to the main subject of the lecture, I want to tell you a story which is so old that it's not even sure if it is true, but some parts of it are. So <clears throat> I will be talking about bribing and corruption behind the Iron Curtain. The time and place is roughly Leipzig in the 80s. So there was a professor of statistical physics there, Uli Ben, many of you know him, uh, who organized a conference on applications of, of stochastic processes in condensed matter, quantum optics, whatever. The highlight of the conference was the concert in the newly bought uh, Gewandhaus Zoo like conduct conducted by Vitor Tutoswalski, one of the most prominent composers of the 20th century, and they played Seventh of Beethoven, Seventh Symphony of Beethoven, and the cello concerto of Lutoswalski, uh, and the soloist was Roman Jabłoński. So I will give you one minute of this if it works. So the concert uh, starts with this very long cadenza by cello. It's uh, one of the most popular 20th century uh, cello concerts played by many leading uh, cellists in the world. It was actually written for um, Stislav Rostropovich. There are fantastic readings by Yoyo Ma, but anyway. So the uh, bribing behind the Iron Card and Dramatis Personal are the ones that you can expect. Maxi, uh, Jose Maria Sancho, uh, Kazik Zanzeski, my supervisor of diploma and half of the, uh, of the PhD thesis, and myself. So what's happening is after the conference, we were sitting in Leipzig drinking uh, beer and uh, making fun of communists, Frankies, whatever you call it, having fun, <coughs> and waiting for the train, because the Spanish guys were going to the west in the night train, and we to the east. However, the Spanish guys didn't have the bad tickets. They had only the, 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 the seats. Okay. So we went to the station with, the, with them because I could speak German and we both could speak Polish. The train was from Warsaw to Paris and then Barcelona. So we went there to the cars with the beds run by the Polish guy who was also very anti-sympathetic. But in this case, we had more courage. We showed him a $5 bill. And he said, Nie ma miejsca, okay. <clears throat> okay, that's the story. <laughs> so, Feliz uh, Anniversary, Maxi. Feliz Anniversary. <clears throat> if it's. So, the subject will be quantum Brownian motion revisited. All these things are. You see, I also have a lot of logos of the things that are giving money. <laughs> so, my group is huge. Theory group of over 20 people. This is old photo, but anyway, two people from this group, uh, Michel Gar Gar uh, Garcia March and uh, Nello Lampo are here at this conference. And they were showing posters. So I mostly will devote, then I will tell you a little what we have done in the recent years. In particular, Nello was involved in this very strongly, but Michel Angel also. And then, uh, if I have time, I will talk a little about um, a uh, new kind of view on quantum Brownian motion problem and similar open system problems in the context of quantum uh, origins of objectivity. Okay, so uh, let me start with the historical 
introduction. Just to, so this is the Brownian motion from Wikipedia. It's a single Brownian uh, particle. Brownian motion, uh, as you know, is defined Brownian motion of pedesis. I didn't know this. Leaping in English. Uh, is the random motion of particles suspended in a fluid uh, resulting from the collisions with fast-moving atoms. Okay? It was discovered in 1827 by uh, Robert Brown, the botanist, but he didn't understand the origins. What is this uh, coming from? The here is that when you have five and many trajectories, at some moment you see it as a very chaotic thing. You, do, you cannot resolve which trajectory belongs to which particle and so on. Uh, the, uh, it was Albert Einstein who studied the particles suspended in the, in the fluid in the famous paper of 1905. Uh, and then he explained this. Uh, this paper is uh, not only important because he explained the motion of, of particles suspended in the fluid, it's also important because it was the first one in which really the concept of stochastic processes were introduced and somehow giving the basis for non equilibrium quantum, uh, non equilibrium statistical physics and, uh, and uh, transport phenomena. Uh, it was Jean Perrin who followed the paper of Einstein in uh, 1908. He verified Einstein's ideas experimentally and got the Nobel in, uh, for his work on discontinuous structure of matter in 26. Einstein, as you know, got the Nobel earlier, but for general services to theoretical physics. This is Einstein, whom everybody... The Einstein paper. Über die von molekular kinetischen Theorie der Wärme geforderte Bewegung von in ruhenden Flüssigkeiten suspendierten Teilchen. Mein Gott. Uh, the interesting thing here is this. Es ist möglich, dass die hier zu behandelnden Bewegungen mit den sogenannten Branchen Molekularbewegung identisch sind. Die mir erreichbaren Angaben über, über Letztere sind jedoch so ungenau, dass ich mir hierüber kein Urteil bilden könnte. So what Einstein says is that it can be that what he does has, is, is identical with Brownian motion, but he doesn't send sufficient information about that. Working in Berlin and in, in uh, Austro-Hungar Empire, in Krakow in particular, uh, who uh, followed the idea of Einstein and somehow tried to prove that indeed what Einstein did was related to Brownian uh, motion. Also, uh, I mentioned here uh, Hans Kramer, a Dutch physicist who worked on Brownian motion a little later. Why? Both of them were interested in Brownian motions in the presence of external forces, for instance, traps or things like that, or just forces uh, driving the system. And the, uh, both of them are interested in the limit of uh, small, uh, in the limit of small mass. Okay, so that's why this limit is in Krakow called Smoluchowski limit, and in Leiden, sorry, and in Leiden is called uh, Kramer's limit, and I call it Smoluchowski Kramer's. Uh, this is uh, Smoluchowski, and this is uh, Kramer's. This is the paper by uh, by uh, by uh, Smoluchowski. So, kinetischen Theorie der Brownian molecular Bewegung und der Suspensionen. Uh, much later, in 1940. Uh, so, uh, the last uh, historical contributions that I want to mention are papers by Caldera and Leggett, who, in a sense, I mean, they are not the first papers talking about the quantum Brownian motion or the motion of the particle in the presence of the reservoir, but they are one of the most influential ones. This is the first one, which was actually about the influence of dissipation on quantum tunneling, so not really the subject. The more important is this one. It's an influence of damping and quantum, on quantum interference and exactly soluble model. So here they consider really a particle which is a harmonic oscillator or free particle, if you wish, if it doesn't have any trap, but if it is trapped, then in the harmonic potential, interacting with many harmonic oscillators which form a bus. The interaction is linear. It's position times position. I mean, quadratic, exactly soluble. They are using uh, feynman vernon pass integral approach, so everything seems to be very complicated, but it's not, obviously. If you look at the density matrix in the position uh, representation 
xy at time t, this is given by the density matrix at time zero, propagated with the kernel, integral kernel, that is nothing more but the Gaussian function. It's an exponent of quadratic form of positions and velocities or momenta, if you wish, of the particles. Of course, it's quite uh, complicated. It depends on the whole trajectories. That's why they use Feynman approach. But roughly speaking, this is the expression of the fact that the Heisenberg equations are linear and you can solve in this model everything. Exactly. Uh, and this was a very influential model for the quantum theory of Brownian motion. So let me now uh, go to my, um, our motivation, first classical. So Brownian motion in, homo in inhomogeneous media and multiplicative noise. This is an old story, obviously. And there are uh, typical suspects who pioneered this uh, subject. This is there are even some people in the audience who are studying and pioneering this kind of subject in the experiments. Okay, this guy. And uh, the typical suspects even worked on the theory of these experiments. Uh, but what, so what is new? I don't know, I wanted to show this one also. Also, this typical suspect are one of the pioneers of working on this uh, small mass limit or a small Lukowski Kramer's limit, that's where. Yeah. Uh, adiabatic elimination for system of Brownian particles with non-constant damping coefficients. So we're already in, I don't know, 86, I guess is this, no, 82 or so. Yes. They were working on the same problem. When I'm talking small mass limit, you can think about it uh, like over, over damped um, motion in which you eliminate adiabatically the fast variable. So what is happening now is uh, on one hand side, this is the review actually that my uh, friends and collaborators Giovanni Volpe and Jan Ver wrote for reports on progress and physics. Volpe did uh, hmm, hmm, PhD at ICFO in my institute. He's an experimental physicist working with this kind of Brownian motion. He's a world master in measuring precisely the forces. So he was, I don't know, measuring forces on the le with the in within using the Brownian motion techniques within the, I don't know, zeta newton some completely absurd uh, resolution uh, a uh, couple of years ago. The, uh, Jan Ver is, on the, in contrast, mathematician, mathematical physicist, and they combine their forces to study, in fact, this uh, uh, Brownian motion in homogeneous media with multiplicative noise, but uh, with a little more modern perspective. So on one hand side, they can have access to the experimental uh, progress, which is enormous. I will come back to that. On the other hand, the mathematical techniques of this adiabatic elimination or homogenization, as the people in mathematics call, have also developed very much. So they study small dissipation theorem without uh, or with uh, feedback and things like that. And this is in this, uh, uh, in this uh, review. So the first paper that they wrote, and which was inspiration for us to look for the quantum aspects of that, uh, was this P PRL with Clemens, with, together with Clemens Behinger group in Stuttgart. And the idea here is that they were looking at the quantum, uh, at the Brownian motion of a particle suspended in the colloid. And this particle was, uh, 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 was closed in the box and near the walls of the box, the motion was changing character, was inhomogeneous in space. And in fact, here in this figure, what you have is a distance from the wall and diffusion constant. So diffusion constant goes to zero as you approach the wall. And for this reason, you have, uh, when you go to the small mass limit, you have new effects. You have no, and anti-ito, if you wish. If you go to the uh, small mass limit here, you get some, uh, some never before measured drifts so forces, if you wish, which act, act on the particles. They measured here distribution of this drift, which is actually Gaussian, but anyway, uh, they measured it and obtained very good um, uh, agreement between theory and uh, experiment. And also they, they were able to conclude that in this particular model, small mass limit corresponds to anti which was kind of surprising. They continued this kind of work, in particular applying this to, as I told you, the systems with feedback. And the uh, systems with feedback is something I explained here. 
Normally, if you have a nonlinear system in which the observable is, let's say, x of t, for instance, position of your Brownian particle, you drive it with the noise, then your position x of t, and you put it back, some function of this f of, f of x of t, and multiply the noise by this. So you have multiplicative noise that come from, from the feedback and can be delayed also, this feedback, obviously. Uh, and this modifies the motion, modifies the fluctuation, even can lead to some kind of control of fluctuation. Again, uh, uh -huh, sorry. What is the second motivation? The second motivation, I told you, the enormous progress in experiments in the last, I don't know, 15 years, maybe. So single particle tracking is the, uh, is the important uh, notion here. Uh, this is again a review in reports on progress in physics written by my friends from ICFO, Carlo Manzo, who is now building his group in University of Vic near Barcelona, and uh, Maria <coughs> uh, Garcia, who we were collaborating on these problems for a certain time. So, uh, what does it mean, single particle uh, tracking is explained here, everybody understands. The point is that they can now using lasers and optical methods, optical imaging and so on, they can make uh, essentially the movie. They can make many photographs trajectories because they have so good resolution both in time and in space. Okay? And that's really something completely new because now you can think about um, comparing the uh, time averages with the um, ensemble averages. So uh, check the ergodicity and things like that. So we have been involved in collaborations with this uh, biophotonics groups in ICFO, uh, exactly inspired first by this paper by Volpe and Ver, in which the particle was moving in the medium in which the diffusion was changing, especially. So we thought that maybe we can help with this kind of models for the problems that they have in biophotonics. So what they do is they take a cell, it can be in vivo even, and they put something on top, tracking. They can image individual trajectories. And if this is a thing which is biologically absolutely not important, then it does simple Brownian motion. It is described perfectly by the Einstein theory. Okay? But if this is uh, uh, something which has biological fun function, then the motion is strange. Okay? So it stops from time to time, I don't know, check something. Or the, the, the diffusion is usually much slower, it's sub-diffusive and so on. Now, some experimental data indicate that, in fact, it is a diffusion constant, or at least phenomenologically you can view it in such a way that this particle which has biological function experiences different values of diffusion constant as it moves. So sometimes there are very low diffusion. For, to describe this kind of experiment, the phenomenological models were just the models of random motion in the disordered medium. However, the new thing was that the disorder was in the diffusion constant. So the particle moves here in the patches, let's say, of, the, of different diffusion values. Here, let's say, diffusion is fast, so it does uh, something like that, but then it comes to the region when it is very slow. And then fast, and so on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this was the idea. Very simple, but apparently not investigated uh, before in this context. And then we applied this theory to the experiments. Of course, uh, as you know, uh, comparing theory with experiment in biology is not very easy, but still, they agreed quite well. Uh, here is a main figure from the paper in which you have this mean square displacement of the individual particles. Uh, well, as a function of time, but average over certain time interval. So you may say this is a time average of the mean square, uh, and here is the ensemble average of their old trajectories. Again, the time mean square displacement it grows with the power of t, which is smaller than one, so it's sub-diffusive. We can also analyze the difference between this uh, time averages and uh, and uh, ensemble averages and conclude about weak, ergo, uh, weak ergodicity breaking in this case. We can also, the, the experimentalists can measure also diffusion constant uh, and it, it is indeed has some uh, distribution with a long tail for small values of the diffusion which supports our phenomenological theory. Okay, uh, we were in the last years interested in looking for the microscopic models of this kind of anomalous diffusion 
And uh, again, the biological, the bio interesting one, which we call prey, and there are also some predat predators, which are more maybe, uh, you can imagine just like that. And this is our particle, which is interesting. And sometimes it meets something like Lapa in the sea, okay, boom. And this thing attaches to it, and then the diffusion is slow, slower. But then at some point, they, they detach, and so on, and so on. So this is the model described here, which was presented in the poster by uh, <coughs> Miguel Angel Garcia, March. Now let me come to quantum motivation. And the first motivation is, again, the same. That the, well, in, in not the same. In the case of uh, studies of the citation from our paper, where most of the papers are quoted, but it's really the literature is very, very, not very extended. Uh, other motivation is, of course, the uh, enormous um, developments in the field of ultra-cold atoms and ultra-cold matter, which means control of the system, which is amazing nowadays. You can read about it in this book. I put this book uh, that we wrote with Anna Sanpera and Veronica Hofinger and published in Oxford in 12. The important thing is that there is a reprint this year, which is... Uh, includes a lot of corrections, in particular the correction of the price, because it is a paperback. So the price is twice lower. Uh, so I give you an example of what people can do in the ultra-cold atoms, and which looks like also a kind of tracking of single particle. Uh, this is from the group of Markus Greiner in Harvard. Uh, the theory was done by Eugene Demler, also from Harvard. So what they do is they have this kind of optical lattice. It's an optical, it's spin up or spin down. Now what they do, they take something which is called quantum atomic microscope or whatever. It's a kind of uh, optical, uh, uh, well, whatever, optical instrument with help of which they can take one atom out of this system. So they create a hole. Now, at the beginning, the atoms do not move because, first of all, the lattice is deep. Second of all, they repulse each other. So it costs a lot of energy to go to the other place. They just don't move. But when the hole arises, then this hole can start to diffuse. And they can track the single hole movements. Not only that, they can also track correlations of these movements with the spin-up. Here is 400 nanometers, let's say. Time scales are milliseconds, single atom tracking, I should say. And with the spin correlations on top of that. This is a, another figure. This is how the, the, how the density of this hole propagates in time. And this is how the correlations with different spin components propagates in time. So it's amazing how much preci precision and control they can have. Uh, in particular, there is a lot of papers in which exactly the problem that I'm interested in is studied. That means the problem of impurity put in the ultra-cold gas. So one of the, uh, this is known under the name Fermi or Bose Polaron. If you put the impurity in the Fermi gas, it's a Fermi Polaron. If you put it in a Bose, Gas, it's a Bose polaron. Okay, so this is the paper on uh, Fermi polarons, uh, uh, in which you put a potassium atom into a sea of lithium atoms, which are polarized with the same spin state. Uh, I'm especially uh, proud of this Nature paper because my postdoc polaron pictures were usual. So what they do is they take this potassium atom in some internal state, they put it into this. Uh, trap with the gas of lithium, and they suddenly change the state of potassium to another spin state, which is very strongly interacting with the lithium atoms. And this is where the polaron is formed. Normally, you analyze these experiments in terms of spectra. So here you have energy spectrum as a function of interaction strength uh, between the potassium and lithium atoms. In fact, inverse of the interaction strength. Zero means infinite interactions. And as you go uh, away, it means uh, smaller interactions. The, uh, so A here is a region of the molecular excitations. And the typical measurements in this uh, kind of experiments look like that. They measure spectra. Okay? Here are polaron branches. Here are these molecular excitations and so on. You use the uh, typical methods of atomic spectroscopy to do that. Uh, 
in case of Bose polarons, first of all, there is a huge amount of theory done in the recent time. In particular, Eugene Demler wrote a paper for the uh, proceedings of the Varenna lecture in 2014, which I very highly recommend, even though it has already two years, but it's very okura. Uh, it has about 60 few pages, and it really covers uh, beautifully the theory of polarons in general and Bose polarons in particular. Uh, there are experiments already in, on Bose polarons. The one that I show you is not exactly Bose polarons, but it's, these are uh, at least, uh, but it's beautiful <laughs> again. So I'm from Geneva, so I work from München, of course. Uh, what they do is the following thing. They have a, one, a set of one, actually they have an array of one dimensional Heisenberg models realized with ultra cold atoms in the laboratory and, and they prepare this or the, this is ferromagnetic model so the spins are uh, ordered ferromagnetically but they flip one of the spins suddenly and then they can with the resolution of single spin they can study the evolution of this propagation and if you wish of this spin wave and in fact they do it on the array as I'm saying so they what they do is they flip the spin here and they look in the horizontal direction what happens on the whole array and the arrays are independent in a sense there is no interactions in the, in the vertical direction okay so now let me tell you what we have done how much i have okay uh, so what we have done is we have we have decided we have to revisit everything so the first paper that we wrote was just a petition of caldera legged but continuous damping and diffusion in this case it was coupling to the quadratic function uh, and, uh, well, and see from the, let's say, more contemporary point of view what happens. So the, uh, if you think about caldera legate model, it has three parts in the Hamiltonian. Uh, there is a H0, which is the free Hamiltonian of the system and of the bus. There is a H1, which is the interaction Hamiltonian of, between the bus and the uh, and the system and there is a, if you wish there can be a potential in which the particle is trapped so we can consider not necessarily Brownian motion in the open space but with somehow the particle is confined in some box or potential the, mo the full Hamiltonian looks therefore like that but the most important thing is in the interaction here you see interaction is a linear function of the harmonic oscillator operators that describe the bath and is some function of position of the particle. Normally, caldera legged, there is X here. It's one of uh, one mark of approximation, even if it's done very systematically as a second order perturbation uh, theory in the coupling, it breaks down. So on this figure, what I plot is uh, uh, temperature in the units of trap frequency in which I trap my Brownian particle. And this is a cutoff parameter as a, uh, the, in the units of the strap frequency. We have a natural cutoff in the problems, for instance, of the impurities because the, because the trap in which we are have a finite uh, uh, depth and things like that. So there is a natural cutoff. So, however, if I change the parameter uh, of my system, the, these lines that are here downstairs indicate that below them the, the bone markov doesn't work and it doesn't work because it leads to the solution in which the density matrix is not positively defined so it's bad now the colors here however mean that here i'm heating my brownian heart particle in this regime of, of this you can call phase diagram here i'm cooling and the cooling is of course the most uh, efficient this uh, uh, very pale green region is the region where the theory is not valid because the uh, born markov breaks down and uh, here again i have cooling uh, sorry heating cooling heating cooling again the cooling is most efficient which is uh, close to the border of the of the validity of the theory the similar things are plotted in this plots so i don't want to go to details but roughly speaking this shows you something which is called quantum squeezing so on the borders of validity of the theory the, the system becomes squeezed the fluctuation of the position are squeezed are much less than the standard quantum limit so we wanted to check whether this thing is really uh, has some sense and therefore we went to an artificial invented model which doesn't have this problem of invalidity because of the non-positively non defined density matrix. We went to a so-called Lindblad model of uh, quantum 
uh, free lunch if you do the, the theory which is mathematically correct. Then again, you can get in the same diagram, but the colors have been changed because Nello Lampo apparently doesn't like to compare the figures from previous paper with the figures with the current paper. Uh, but anyway, you have cooling here in the blue region, all right? And the cooling is, but it's much smaller. The region of cooling is much smaller than the one that we were uh, observing in the Bohr-Markov approximation. So it was not a very good news. This is from the nonlinear model. It's the same thing. The cooling is there, but it's practically uh, not really efficient. So uh, then we said, OK, then we have to solve the problem exactly. So we went to a bose polaron problem. And we try to, uh, to, uh, to treat it as, a, um, as a, so it doesn't move too much. And the Bose-Einstein condensate in which it is uh, put is huge. So that the coupling practically, in this case, depends very weakly on the position. So here there is no problem of inhomogeneity. We linearize the coupling. We had the standard Caldera model not standard, caldera legate model, but with the density of states that is different because it corresponds to the Bose-Einstein condensate, which has phonons that have a linear dispersion relation that change into the quadratic, etc. Some technical difference. But anyway, this hasn't been calculated before, so we looked at that. And indeed, here in this case, as a function of, again, temp for low temperatures, you can get a parameter. This is the squeezing, as you say. You can squeeze position of the particle, fluctu quantum fluctuation of the particle very strong. Now, so we want to go to the small mass limit, but taking into account now uh, inhomogeneous damping and diffusion. And there is a big progress, especially due to the work on Sun Ho Lim, who is a student of Jan, so Jan Ver. So it's a very rigorous mathematical work. I just mention what is this. I mean, in quantum mechanics, uh, one of the problems is how to relate the fragile microscopic world with what we see, all right? And there is a huge literature on decoherence, which explains the collapse of ray fraction, uh, measurements theory due to interaction with the, uh, with the environment. But recently, the questions that people are starting to ask us the following. How, how is it possible that when we measure, say, Brownian particle and its position, and I measure, and Roberta measures, and Maxi measures, we all get the same macro describe it is the following thing. That, of course, this particle interacts with the environment. But you divide the env environment into different uh, individuals, me, Roberta, Maxi, and so on. And the rest of the reservoir, which you really are not interested in. Now, this rest, you trace out. This is what gives you decoherence and dissipation for your system. But those who are measuring, you don't. And now you may ask yourself, how should the density matrix of the system look like in order to have objectivity, and this is more or less this far. So after the coherence, after the coherence took place, after collapse, if you wish, of the wave function took place, the density matrix should be a mixture of something which are called pointer states for the system. So these are the outcomes of the measurement, uh, enumerated by I here, with certain probabilities. But the observers, so this part of the uh, reservoir, which we don't trace out, these are the people who really do measurement, Maxi, Roberta, and me, they should be in a product state perfectly correlated with this. Perfectly correlated for a given observer, so let's say EK, EK, this is me, the supports of this density matrices corresponding to different outcomes are, are uh, simply not overlapping. So this is a direct sum, if you wish, my density matrix here. Now, that means that if I get the answer I, automatically Maxi will get the um, uh, answer I, and Roberta will get the answer I, and the system will be in the pointer uh, X. This is automatically assured by this form, which is called broadcasting form. Now, how to study if the systems go to this form? Take a Brownian motion model, take, take a, uh, some other um, uh, models of interaction with environment, Hopefully, the ones that you can handle, so exactly soluble or something like that, and check whether it happens. And there is a lot of papers on that, which uh, mostly go from Horodetsky uh, group, but not only. I wanted to mention that this paper from the group 
uh, here they connect this problem of not exactly achieving objectivity but this related quantum Darwinism with the problem whether your interaction with the reservoir is Markov from Mifisk. And I think I finish the quantum narcissus which is, and some of you know that I wrote a book on uh, Polish jazz, which is a guide to Polish jazz recording. However, interesting thing is that there are at least 10 or 15 records of one Mallorquinian artist which are reported in this book. This is one of the most uh, prominent avant-garde artists in the, uh, I would say in the world, and this is which I dedicate to. Here he is not so avant-garde. And he plays a song actually which is based on Mallorquinian folk tune. I don't know the title, but it's not so avant-garde. Normally he goes inside the piano with the stones and things like that, but here he plays. Thank you very much. Time for maybe a question? The first question? One? Um, yeah, Maciek. Yeah. I, I would like to I would like to ask you about the uh, uh, um, quantum random work because in, for classical systems quant random work is very re closely related with Brownian motion, it's a, it's a simplified model for Brownian motion and so on. Yes. But uh, uh, in, in, for quantum systems it seems that they are completely unrelated, mm -hmm. this quantum random okay. work created by... Yeah. Uh, so the, I mean from my point of view if I think about uh, random walk and quantum random walk, I would normally use your understanding. So the same as between Brownian motion. This is something like that, that you have a particle, let's say, moving in the, in the, uh, in the lattice. And then at each, so like uh, in the random walk, but at each uh, st a particle has some internal degree of freedom. And at each step, I, I toss this internal, I, I apply some unitary matrix on this internal degree of freedom. So let's say spin. So if the spin is up, I move to the left. If the spin is up, I move to the right. But then I build a superposition state of this particle depending on how this, uh, uh, how the spins are oriented. So in a sense, the evolution looks here like that. If spin is up, I'm, so suppose I'm in the superposition state, okay? So in the first step, I move like that. Now I apply a unitary on the spins, which might do something like that, or I don't know, move them. And then I do the next step. So a part will come back here, part will, there will be interference and so on. And this is what people call quantum random walk in the literature. And then I like uh, classical random walks help for some algorithms in classical computer science that this thing will help in some uh, quantum uh, search problems. But I agree, I say in the notional science it's very bad, I would say, because I, yeah.